In this video, we want to take what we did in the previous video, demand and supply, looking at the functional forms for them and put them together. Let's start by just kind of quickly reviewing what we would do in a principles class. In a principles class, we would have actually our inverse demand and our inverse supply curves because we would have P up here. Our demand curve would look like this. Our supply curve would be upward sloping. And then we'd simply identify where the two cross each other. So that we could call, let's just call it P and Q. And that's how we would identify the equilibrium. But if we're talking about two functions that cross each other, then what that means is that at that point, the two functions are equal to each other. If we were to take a P and plug it into both the demand and supply curves, we would get the same Q out. Or if we were to take a Q, plug it into the demand and supply curves, we would get the same P out. So what we can do, knowing that, is we can simply take the either the inverse demand and inverse supply curve or the demand and supply curve, and we can set those equal to each other. And out of that will come the equilibrium price and quantity. So let's look at the actual demand and supply curves that we were thinking about. So if we were thinking about demand, we had a demand curve that looked like this. Quantity demanded is equal to 500 minus 100p. There's the demand curve that we talked about in the video just before this one. We can think about the supply curve. QS, we had negative 100 plus 100p. There's the demand curve and the supply curve. In that previous video, I don't think I had the subscript QD and QS. That's fine. What we're going to do when we put them equal to each other is we're just going to drop the subscripts because quantity demanded and quantity supplied are equal to each other at the equilibrium. So we can just make that Q. So it's not that important. We could think about the inverse demand and the inverse supply. So inverse demand, those were solved for P. Our inverse demand was P equals um, 5 minus Q over 100. And since that's the inverse demand, I'll put the subscript D on there. Our inverse supply was P equals 1 plus quantity supplied over 100. So we can think about these functions either in terms of the demand and supply curve version or the inverse demand, inverse supply curve. But always remember that this function and this function are inverses of each other, our demand curve and our inverse demand curve. Likewise, our supply curve and our inverse supply curve are just inverses of each other. Okay. So what we know about equilibrium is the definition of the equilibrium price is the price at which quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. So we can just drop the subscript and just call it Q. And then what we've got is that Q equals this and Q equals that. So we can set those two things equal to each other. So um, let's set demand and supply equal to each other. So we have 500 minus 100p is equal to negative 100 plus 100p. There's my demand curve. It's equal to my supply curve. Quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. Now all I have to do is solve that for p. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start moving my terms with P to one side and my terms without P to the other side. So if I move this over, over here I'm going to get 200P and over here I'm going to get 600. And then if I divide both sides by 200, I'm going to get P equals $3. My equilibrium price in this situation is $3. Once I've figured out my equilibrium price, I can plug that price back into either my demand curve or my supply curve. Let's do it with the demand curve. So if we plug in 
um, P equals three right there. So I'm gonna circle that because that's our equilibrium price. Now, quantity is equal to 500 minus 100 times three. So quantity is equal to 500 minus 300 is equal to 200. My equilibrium quantity in this market is 200 units. And each of those units will be sold for a price of $3. Each will be bought for a price of $3. Notice that if we were to plug that price of $3 back into our supply curve, we would get Q equals negative 100 plus 300, Q equals 200. We would get the exact same quantity. So you can plug that price back into either of these and it's gonna tell you what the quantity is because they're crossing at that point. So the quantity is going to be exactly the same. So what we've done here is just taken the demand curve and the supply curve and we've mathematically solved for the equilibrium price and the quantity. We know exactly what the price is and we know exactly what the quantity is. We can also do this by instead of working with the demand curve and the supply curve, we can work with the inverse demand curve and the inverse supply curve. Let's do that. Okay, so our, when we set, if P equals this and P equals that, then this equals that. So five minus Q over 100 is equal to one plus Q over 100. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to move all of the terms that involve Q to one side and all of the other terms to the other side. So I'm going to move the one over here. That gives me four equals Q over 100 plus Q over 100. So I've got a common denominator so I can add these fractions. This gives me four equals 2q over 100. I'm going to multiply both sides by 100 to get that part out of there. I get 400 equals 2q. I'm going to divide both sides by q. I get q equals 200. The exact same answer I got right there. Now that I've solved for q, I can plug that back into either of these. So if I do that, let's plug it back into my inverse demand curve. P equals 5 minus um, 200 over 100. That is P equals 5 minus 2. P equals 3. Same answer I got right there. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I set my demand curve and my supply curve equal to each other or if I set my inverse demand curve and my inverse supply curve equal to each other. We get the exact same answer. If we graph this with the demand curve and the supply curve, now we've got Q up here, we've got P down here. If I'm dealing with my demand curve, my demand curve has an intercept of 500 downward sloping. My supply curve has an intercept of negative 100, so I know it's coming up right through like this. And we've just solved for our equilibrium quantity, which is 200 units, and our equilibrium price, which is $3. And you can see that this picture is just the inverse of that picture. So it doesn't matter which way that you solve this, although I would encourage you when you're drawing your pictures, go ahead and draw them the way you're used to. That's how I do. I'm showing you this, but I'm only showing you so that hopefully it reinforces what's going on in that picture. Okay. One of the things that I notice that students have a problem with is that oftentimes this step um, kind of throws students off. This step was easy because I have a common denominator, but um, that step might throw you off if you don't have a common denominator. So if you have problems with that step, um, 
I've got some practice problems that I can make available to you. Um, if you just want to verify that you're working through the algebra correctly, um, let me know and I'll, make, I'll, I'll get uh, that worksheet to you. Let me show you just quickly an example where um, you don't have a common denominator just to show you one of the pitfalls. So this is a separate problem. We're going to continue working with this, but let me show you what would happen. Let's suppose we had an inverse demand curve that looks like this. P equals 7 minus Q over 50. And let's have an inverse supply curve that looks like this. P equals 1 plus Q over 100. There's no reason why you couldn't have an inverse demand and supply curve that look like that. But now let me show you what's going to happen here. So when we set these equal, we're going to have 7 minus Q over 50 equals 1 plus Q over 100. So I'm going to move my 1 over to that side. I'm going to get 6 equals Q over 50 plus Q over 100. I brought this Q over 50 to this side. Now we don't have a common denominator. You can't just add those two things together. The common denominator, though, is going to be 100, and I can get that denominator of 100 by multiplying this by 2, but that means I also have to multiply that by 2. So I can write this this way. 6 is equal to 2Q over 100 plus Q over 100. Now I've got a common denominator. All I did was multiply my numerator and my denominator by 2. The 2's will cancel out, so I haven't done anything other than make it to where I can now add these two fractions. So 6 is equal to 3Q over 100. So if I've got 2Q here and another Q there, I've got 3Q. But I've got to keep it over my denominator of 100. So, and then it's easy. You just have to do some reducing to solve that down for Q. So make sure in this step, I had a common denominator and it was easy. I could just go right to there. But if this number and that number aren't the same, you need to find the common denominator. And again, for some of my students that haven't done this in a little while, that is a commonly made mistake. So make sure that you just review that. What we want to do now here, now that we understand mathematically how to solve for equilibrium, and hopefully you see it's not hard, what we want to do is go to the next step and talk about what drives a market towards equilibrium? So I need to erase this, and then we'll take a look at that. Let's review something that you would have talked about in your principles of micro class, and that is how a market moves toward the equilibrium. How does price end up going to that, that equilibrium price? So if we think about the picture that you're used to looking at, again, we'll go back to our inverse demand, inverse supply curve, but I'm just going to describe it as if it's demand and supply. So here's our demand curve. Here's our supply curve. Here's our equilibrium price, P star. But remember, nobody involved in the market sees that picture. We can talk about it theoretically, but nobody out there in the real world sees this. So the question is, well, how does the price get to P star? If we think about types of markets that are competitive markets, the gasoline market is a great example of, of in most bigger towns in any city, it's a good example of a perfectly competitive market. If we were talking about a small town with one or two gas stations, that's not a good example. But most places have several gas stations. And so it's, it, we can think about how does the price get to P star, whatever the equilibrium is? Well. Let's start by thinking about what happens if price is down here at P1. Well, if price is at P1, what we know is that here's the quantity supplied, here's the quantity demanded, and this difference right there between quantity supplied and quantity demanded, because quantity demanded is higher than quantity supplied, we call that a shortage. And anytime there's a shortage in the market, that's going to put upward pressure on price. If we were thinking about a price that's higher than equilibrium, like say P2, then we know that at that price, there's going to be a surplus. Here's quantity demanded, and right out here's quantity supplied, and that difference right there is the surplus. And a surplus puts downward pressure on price. So let's 
kind of review that. If there's a shortage, let's suppose that the way a shortage looks is that you want to sell some units a particular day. Let's suppose I'm a seller. And so I open up the store and by 11 o'clock I've sold out and more people keep coming in through the rest of the day and say, hey, I wanted to buy one of those. Do you have them? And I have to say, no, I ran out this morning. It doesn't take you very long. You don't have to even have an economics class to realize that you can probably raise the price of those things. People want to buy enough of them that you can raise your price. You don't need to know where P-Star is. As long as there's a shortage, there will be an incentive for sellers and buyers to raise price. Or if we think about it the other way, let's suppose there's a surplus. So I want to sell some units today and I put them out there on my table to sell and I, I open up the doors and ever so often somebody comes in to buy one, but at the end of the day I didn't sell all I wanted to. Well, those aren't making money for me if they're not selling. And so if I've got to figure out how to sell something and I don't have enough people that are coming in to want to buy it, there's a pretty strong incentive for me to lower price. And so that puts downward pressure on price. And I don't need to know where P-Star is. As long as there's a surplus, then there's still going to be an incentive to lower price until that surplus goes away and that happens at P-Star. So it's surpluses and shortages that drive the market towards that equilibrium price. Okay. Let's think about how this works in what we're talking about. So we can think about using our demand curve and our supply curve to figure out the amount of surplus or shortage. Another word for a surplus is excess supply and another word for a shortage is excess demand. So we can calculate either excess supply or excess demand. Let's think about the model we're working with, the demand curve and the supply curve we're working with, and let's calculate excess supply. We know our equilibrium price was $3. So if we were to put our numbers in here, it was $3 and 200 units. Let's figure out what the excess supply would be, given our demand and supply curves, at a price of $4. Okay. So if we calculate quantity demanded at a price of $4, all we have to do is take our demand curve, quantity demanded is equal to 500 minus 100 times 4. We'll plug in our $4 for the price. That gives us, uh, I'm just going to write Q here, Q equals 500 minus 400. Q is equal to 100. Buyers want to buy 100 units at a price of $4. So what we've got here is 100 units. That's quantity demanded. Let's talk about quantity supplied here at a price equal to $4. And our supply curve looked like this. Quantity supplied is equal to negative 100 plus 100. Now we're going to plug in our 4. So we get quantity supplied. I'm just going to write Q. It's equal to negative 100 plus 400. Q is equal to 300. That tells us right there is 300 units. So what we get is that 300 units is how many sellers want to sell. Buyers want to buy 100 of those, so the excess supply is going to be 200 units. So excess supply is equal to quantity supplied minus quantity demanded. It's equal to 300 minus 100. There is going to be a surplus of 200 units. So you can see that figuring out the surplus or the shortage is not hard. You just have to take the price plug it into the demand curve, plug it into the supply curve, see what the quantities are at those prices, and then figure out the, uh, either the surplus or shortage. Let's talk about now some changes in equilibrium. So we know that in a principles class, if we talked about a demand curve shifting or the supply curve shifting, then we just draw the new demand curve and the new supply curve and identify the new equilibrium. But given what we're working through here mathematically, you can see that all we need to do is change either the intercept of the demand curve or the intercept of the supply curve, whichever one changes, and then set them equal to each other. 
So let's do, uh, let's consider an increase in demand of 50 units. Consider an increase in demand of 50 units. So another way to describe this would be, suppose demand changes such that buyers want to buy 50 more units at every price. Well, our initial demand curve was Q equals 500 minus 100P. That was our initial demand curve that we're using right here. We had just plugged in a price of 4. We know that to change demand, you simply change the intercept of the demand curve. So our new demand curve is going to be Q is equal to 550 minus 100P. There's our new demand curve. What we want to do is set that equal to our supply curve. Now, supply didn't change, so we need to set it equal to the original supply curve, which is right here. Quantity is equal to negative 100 plus 100P. There's the original supply curve. We don't want to change the intercept of this one because supply didn't change. So we're going to set our demand curve, 550 minus 100P. That's our new demand curve equal to the original supply curve, negative 100 plus 100 P. And then we simply solve that for P. So we get, I'm going to move my 100 over here, we get 650 is equal to 200 P. I'm going to flip these around. So 200 P is equal to 650. That means P is equal to 650 divided by 200. My, those zeros cancel out. That gives me 13 over 4. So notice my new price is now 13 over 4. We can figure out what that is in terms of a decimal. That's just equal to 3.25, $3.25. So what we see here is that here's the situation we started with. I'm going to draw my inverse demand and inverse supply curve. Had a demand curve and a supply curve. Our initial equilibrium was a price of 3, a quantity of 200. We had an increase in demand. Here's our demand curve, supply. An increase in demand we know is going to drive price up and it's going to drive quantity up. What we've just seen is this particular increase in demand drove price up by 25 cents to $3.25. We still need to know how much it drove quantity up. So we need to plug in 13 over 4 into either our new demand curve or the original supply curve. So if we do that, let's plug it into our demand curve. So Q is equal to 550 minus 100, and I'm going to plug our price in, times 13 over 4. So this is equal to 550 minus my 4, we'll divide into my 125, I've still got the 13. So that's equal to 550 minus 325. That gives me a quantity equal to 225 units. So my quantity went up from 200 to 225. So an increase in demand of 50 units drives my price up by 25 cents, and it drove my quantity up in the market by 25 units. Let's think now about a shift in both curves. So if we had a shift, here I had a shift in demand. If you have a shift in demand, change the intercept of only the demand curve, like we did in this picture, or in this example. If we have a shift in supply, change the intercept of the supply curve, only. Now don't mess with demand. Set the new supply curve equal to the original demand curve. Work it out, you'll get that new intersection. We could have a shift in both curves by different amounts. I could say, let's suppose 
we have an increase in demand of 50 units and a decrease in supply of 100 units. Then you change the intercept of the demand curve by 50 units in the appropriate direction. Change the intercept of the supply curve by 100 units in the appropriate direction. Set the new demand curve equal to the new supply curve and out of that's going to come the new equilibrium. So working with changes in both demand and supply is not hard. You simply have to set, change the intercepts appropriately and then set them equal to each other. And you'll be able to figure out exactly what happens to price and quantity. So that's a much better, more informative way of, of working the problem out than what we did with demand and supply in a principles class. With demand and supply you had an intersection and you changed your supply curve or your demand curve and you said okay my equilibrium goes from A to B and uh, A to B and you can see that that drove my price down and it drove my quantity up and that's all you could say. Price is going to fall, quantity is going to rise. Now we're actually able to not only say that price goes in a particular direction but we know exactly how much it's going to go in that direction and we can change, we can talk about the change in quantity in terms of how many units it changes. So you can see that adding just a little bit of math to it, even though the math is not hard, um, allows us to do a lot more with this, this particular model. So again, let me say that if any of these steps give you any problems, if, if working through the algebra of this Maybe you understand it, but you just need some extra practice. Let me know and I can get you some, uh, some problems. I have a few worksheets to put together where I have six or seven, maybe even more than that, sets of demand and supply curves. And, and it's just a matter of setting them equal and working through the algebra of it. Once you do a, a few of them, uh, I think you'll see that it's not that tough. So what we need to do now is we, I want to end this video here. In the next video, we're going to talk about our elasticity. And so we're going to take this model of demand and supply and we're going to think about how to use the, the math of what we've learned here to figure out elasticity. So I'll see you in that video.